zakah on debts. The Prophet, peace be upon him, kept asking for protection from being in debt. And also, Allah revealed the longest verse in the Qur'an dealing about this matter, as it is so important. Concerning a debt owed by the payer of zakah, the basic rule is that if a person's debt is more than his property, which is considered for the nisab, or it reduces his property so that it is short of the nisab, he does not pay zakah. But if his debt does not reduce his property to be below the nisab, then he subtracts the value of his debt from his property and then pays zakah on the amount that is left. For example, if an individual possesses $10,000, and he is in debt up to the tune of $10,000. Zakah is not mandatory on him. This is because the debt overshadows the nisab. This is also the case if he owes $9,950. In this case, he does not pay zakah because the amount he owes has reduced his property so that it is short of the nisab. However, if he is in debt, of $4,000, he is required to deduct this amount from his money, then $6,000 on which his zakah is compulsory will be the remainder. This is only the case if the debtor did not use the debt for trade, such as if he buys a house that he will pay off in installments over a few years, or use the debt to purchase machines worth millions to start a huge project as a trader might decide to expand his work, and thus he buys a new production line for a few millions, which he adds to the one he already has. Do these investment debts lead to dropping zakah from the assets as well? To say that it does drop the zakah would mean that there would be a loss of large sums of money from zakah due to the poor, and may end up... To say that it does drop the zakah would mean that there would be a loss of large sums of money from zakah that is due to the poor, and may end in the opinion that many of the contemporary traders are not subject to paying zakah. The second symposium on contemporary zakah issues held in Kuwait concluded that, first, all debts that finance commercial work are deducted from assets upon which zakah is compulsory. If the debtor does not have fixed assets that are more than his basic needs. Secondly, investment debts that finance industrial projects, exploited assets, are deducted from assets upon which zakah is compulsory. If the debtor does not have fixed assets that are more than his basic needs, in a way that makes the deduction a substitute for the debt. If those investment debts are deferred, he should deduct from the assets upon which zakah is obligatory. The demanded annual installment, if these goods exist, then they are put in exchange for the debt, if they are enough. In this case, the debts are not deducted from the assets upon which zakah is compulsory. If, however, they are not enough to pay off the debt, the remaining sum is deducted from the assets upon which zakah is compulsory. Thirdly, for deferred housing loans, which are usually paid in long-term installments, a debtor pays as zakah the money that remains from what he has after deducting the annual installment required of him, if the rest makes the nisab or more. As for the zakah to be paid on a debt owed to the payer of zakah, if he foresees an impossibility of the redemption of the loan, for instance, as a result of the debtor being bankrupt, or the debtor who keeps procrastinating or showing signs of postponement regarding the payment of the loan, or one who denies the debt, in this case the creditor or payer of zakah is not liable to pay zakah every year on this amount, but he pays zakah for a year once he recovers the loan. If he does not foresee any impossibility of its redemption, for instance, if the debtor does not procrastinate or show any signs of postponement regarding the payment of the loan as he intends to pay it, in this case, the creditor 
or payer of zakah is liable to pay zakah on it every year. This is because it is considered as if the money is in his custody. There are many different types of debts. One of them is known as bonds. A bond is a certificate obligating its issuer verbally or in writing to pay its bearer a specified amount when due in addition to an agreed upon interest payable in accordance with the face value of the bond. It is clear that it is usury and it is forbidden. Because it is indeed the accruement of interest from loans and anybody dealing in bonds should turn in repentance to Allah the Most High. Bonds are deferred debts for their bearer upon the authority that has issued them. Consequently, zakah on bonds is judged in the same manner as the ruling on zakah on debts. So zakah becomes mandatory on it when it attains a nisab on its own. Or when other things owned by the payer, for example, currencies or commercial commodities are added to it and a full year lapses on it. In this case, a quarter of one-tenth is paid. When the bond is not yielding except till after some period, zakah is not waived but paid whenever the bond is due, paying the arrears of all the past years. As for exploited assets, which covers all that is intended for rent and is not intended for trade in itself, such as real estate, cars and production plants and the like, scholars agreed that no zakah is due on the actual assets but its yield is subject to zakah. Yet, it is added into the money the owner has and to any trade goods to calculate the nisab and hawl. A quarter of a tenth should be paid as zakah for the total amount as is the case for zakah of money. There is another matter that should be discussed concerning zakah which is end of service remuneration and retirement remuneration. Zakah is not obligatory to be paid on these dues while the employee or worker is still in service because there is no complete ownership that warrants the obligation of zakah as he can neither spend from it nor exercise any of the ownership rights on it during his years of service. But if the employee receives this money at one time or spread out over a period of time then his ownership of these dues becomes complete and he pays zakah on whatever he collects just as he pays zakah on the money he owns and benefits from. It was stated in the first zakah conference that any financial benefit is subject to zakah and should be added to the money the payer of zakah has when considering the nisab and hawl. And there is another type of property which raises some questions. It is money paid in advance by the leaseholder to the landlord to ensure the rented object is returned in a good condition. No zakah is due from the leaseholder as he has no control over the money, so he does not have full possession of it, which is a condition needed for zakah to be obligatory. As for intangible assets like an author's publication rights, intellectual property, patents and trademarks, no zakah is payable on them because they do not fulfill the conditions of zakah. But when it yields return, these are treated as money he owns and benefits from. Concerning zakah on wages, salaries and profits from free freelance work, the majority of scholars stated that zakah is not paid for these when taken possession of them. Rather, they are added to his other properties that are subject to zakah depending on the nisab and hawl. So, zakah is given out for all the properties when the hawl has passed, beginning from when the nisab was completed. Whatever benefit he receives from this money during the hawl, zakah will be paid for that too at the end of the hawl, even though the hawl is not complete for each and every part of these properties. So long as a hawl has passed over the ownership of the one who pays zakah for the properties as a whole. The value that should be paid out is a quarter of a tenth or 2.5%. The wealth which is inviolable in itself, such as alcohol and pork, is not subject to zakah because it is not considered wealth that has any value in Islam. Such wealth must be disposed of in the manner prescribed by Islamic law for that wealth. But wealth, which is inviolable for an external reason, which is earned through a defective method, 
it is not obligatory for the rightful owner to pay zakah for it due to the absence of the full ownership condition which is needed to make the wealth subject to zakah. If however it returns to its rightful owner, he must pay zakah for one year even if years have passed according to the chosen opinion. The holder of the inviolable wealth is still considered as possessing it if he does not return it to its rightful owner and he has to pay the zakah due on it. But the sin for taking it remains for what wealth remains with him. And him paying zakah on the wealth would be considered as part of the religious obligations due on the money or property. The money he paid out will not be considered as zakah which he would be rewarded for. Nor will this discharge him of the sin of taking it unless he returns all the wealth to its rightful owner if he knows him or gives it out in charity on that owner's behalf if he despairs of knowing him.